All right, all right. Um, end-to-end -end testing, or as you people call it, and view end testing. I mean, Vapan is nice. I appreciate it. Um, I view it as something interesting. Um, I'm Gleb Bakhmutov. I'm everywhere on the internet. You can find me under my last name on Twitter. I put all my projects on GitHub. I share a lot of code. I worked at a bunch of companies in Boston and I kind of had a journey in my professional life. I started with C, C++, right? I did oh, like, you know, graphics, computer vision. I did Google Street View before Google Street View did the Street View part. When I kind of went to Java, C Sharp, and I started working on the back end, and then through CoffeeScript, I've been able to jump to the front end and did data visualization. And then Angular came out, and I kind of loved Angular, GF, right? Not Angular. And after a while, I was like, okay, Angular took a sharp turn towards Java corporate stuff, and I didn't like that. But then Vue came out. I was like, Vue is exactly what Angular 2 should have been. So I started using Vue. Now mostly I code in Node and HyperAppJS, but Vue is my personal website, so I love Vue. My proudest achievement, though, is this little uh, JavaScript thing where you can put on your bookmark, and then you can play a game of uh, GitHub on any GitHub contribution chart, and find maybe you'll find something interesting. Some, like some of those games actually generate a self-repeating pattern that's kind of cool. Um, so uh, I've been happy user of Cypress, an open source test runner, for a year. And then they finally convinced me to actually join the company. So I, for a year I've been working at Cypress.io. Right? But I'm not trying to sell you anything, it's open source. And we are a very small company, we're only 12 people. And we're all remote, some people in Atlanta, I'm in Boston. But uh, the question I'm trying to ask and answer is really, how do we make our users happy? Right? My users are happy, they open the website that I sold them, or web application that I have written to them. If they're like that, if, they, if you see smiles, you're getting paid. And not just one time, they come back to you with more features and more projects, and you will get paid more, right? At the same time, if whatever you deliver doesn't perform to whatever users actually expect, you're not getting paid, but, but, but easy. So when people ask, like, what's the value of testing? Well, there is no value. But about tests, you cannot actually make sure that the software behaves the way you actually promise the users it will behave. And if the users, if the software behaves the way users expect it to behave, then it's a quality software, and then you're getting paid. So the only reason to write tests is to get to the quality part. Like yes, there are formal proof, you know, formal proof of software is going nowhere. The only way we know that to check our software is to actually test it. And the testing pyramid, like the types of tests that you can write, usually have a lot of tests at the bottom, the unit test, where you test the smallest components. And the shape of this pyramid really depends on the tool we, tools we have. So we, have a, we write a lot of unit tests because the software we have, the tools we have available today, make it so damn easy. Right? You pick up any testing framework and you start writing unit tests easy. Lots of choices. Really easy to cover a whole, you know, I guess, source code with a lot of unit tests. So we write a lot of them. <coughs> but unit test is kind of like taking a part in isolation and making sure that it actually fits the specs, right? You can control the part and you measure it. There are a lot of choices, like which framework you pick. I don't really care. I use all three of them all the time. Mocha, Ava, test. Kind of like just Right, Jest is kind of popular, there is a huge corporation behind it, and they invest a lot of time in development, so it actually be behaves very, very well. You install it, you write something that looks like this, describe block, you import your code that you want to test, and you write the test. For example, you expect add when called is 1 and 2 to be free. Really easy. You take the piece of code, you run it, and then you compare the you know, result with what you expect. And it shows passing tests, everything nice. Just gives you a lot of extra things like code coverage, you know, parallelization of your tests if they run fast, running previously failing tests for snapshots, things like that. 
But by itself, unit tests don't give you much confidence that the whole thing is going to work. Right? Like each part kind of behaves normally. Right? The legs go up and down. You know, you can do push-ups. The head is looking somewhere. But you have to put these things together. Right? You kind of start, have to assemble the Lego pieces. So the next level is integration test, where you actually test a component. You know, something that's larger than just a, you know, a function. Uh, here's an example of a view component. And I'm using TypeScript here, but it's pretty standard single file component. It has a template, some properties there, and the property is defined on a class hello world. So in this case, it's a message. Excellent. So we can write a test using view test details, which are standard. That's a view team responsibility. They provide this library, makes testing very, very simple. In this case, if we have a message set to new message and then we mount this component by itself in this some kind of artificial environment, and we set the props data to be that message, then we expect to be rendered to see the text equal to the message. So we take that component, we do something artificial, we mount it somewhere in some kind of nebulous artificial browser equivalent, we hope, and then we expect it to render something. You can interact with a component, you can, for example, find a button, and you can trigger events on that button. And again, everything happens in this artificial, non-real browser. And the way this thing does, the testing tools do these things, they actually change the way things are rendered. Like they call you like next tick, they try to move like data propagation under the hood so you don't see it, just so that they can make the test appear synchronous, right? You trigger a click and you immediately look at the result, at the render result, which is not the way things work in the real world. But for purpose of component testing, that simplifies things a lot, right? You control component and you observe the result. And again, you always interact with, not with a component itself, but with some kind of wrapper that the view test utils give you, that wraps the component, that can trigger events, that can get you the text, the render text. So you always interact with some kind of artificial entity around your component. You can set data, you can set props, you can emit events. You know, do a lot of stuff. View test utils allow you to trigger those things and do those things to your component and then you can observe the results. And immediately you will find things that by itself are good, but when you actually test the component, they actually don't, don't produce much confidence. This is kind of nice, right? Again, the unit tests are passing, but the integration tests where you actually start putting things together immediately show problems. Um, once you get to more complicated things, like you know, testing a component that uses routing, you have to do more stuff. For example, you want to render your component full, and you have to mark the routing component, right? And you have to set paths, and then you expect, you know, that your component to, for example, render that path, and you expect it to contain what you just passed. And the question in my mind, whenever I look at those tests, and whenever they run, I like. Did it really work? Because I don't see anything. I cannot open my visual, you know, I cannot open a real browser and actually absorb it, rendering text. You know, the view test details tell me that, oh yeah, whatever it, you know, the text returns will actually have that path. But is it actually correct? Is it path and maybe a question mark? Or maybe there is path, question mark, undefined equals foo? Maybe there's something extra going on. Maybe this matches accidentally and then switches to undefined. And another thing is that whenever I run this test, I always have this nagging feeling that yes, it works in test tools. And if test tools emulates my browser using JSDOM, for example, that this works under this condition, this version of test tools and this version of JSDOM. And JSDOM is not a real browser. It's just emulation. And you have to actually make your app work in a real browser that has its own bugs, its own quirky behavior, 
And just time is kind of behind that behavior, so they try to emulate it, but it has its own box, its own quirky behavior. So you're actually working through test tools to just done, but behind the real browser. So when you deliver the thing to the actual customer, you're like, this looks nothing like what I expected. It generates all sorts of errors, and you're like, well, I tested it. And how did you test? Well, there's these test tools. So to me, this always has been a nagging question whenever I ran tests. The, the real test, or we're supposed to emulate the user experience, is this end-to-end -end test at the very top of the pyramid. And it's at the very top of the pyramid because it's so hard to write good end-to-end -end tests that are not flaky, useful, fast, compared to writing you know, tests below. Just because the tools suck. And if you think about like, how you, would you actually test a real web application, you would open a real browser, not emulation, not just that, a real browser. You would load actual application, not a particular component in some kind of sandbox. No, you want to open the app that you are about to show to the customer. Right? Yes, it could have some parts, like some network parts stuff or marked, maybe a payment system. But the rest should be as real as possible. It could be running a server on your local machine or on staging, but it's serving the real application. And it should interact with the app the way the user would interact. Right? And let me give you an example. Let's say that you click on a button or you type something in a text box. You really want to type something in an input box when the input box is not covered by some other element. You see, when your app loads and it displays a splash screen, well, you cannot type the input, the input box behind it. So your testing tool has to actually check if the input box is available, is actionable, is actually reachable, and type into it. So there are all these assumptions built into interacting with application. And then you want to make sure that it works. Right, and, and I'll show what it means. Okay, so it's, compared to unit test, it's not just measuring an individual part in isolation. It's like, I built a car, let me put it on a dyno stand, let me wrap it, and, and see how it behaves. And if the engine blows up, well, good thing, but I actually tested this because my customer would actually be very pissed about it if they actually discover it when they actually go take it to the race track. So, um, what I'm about to show you, I described in a blog post. I love you myself, I run it on my personal website. So, I, I wrote a little application that's just to do MVC, because it's the most complex app I can write. But it has UI, it uses Vux as a data store, and whenever there are any actions, it actually sends it to the server and save the things in a database and then receive the results. So it kind of simulates normal common web application. You have DOM, you have data store, and you actually send things to the server. Um, in a diagram, it looks like this. So the app has UI, everything is inside a data store, new to do tags, to do, maybe something else, makes REST API calls to the backend. Uh, that looks like this, pretty standard stuff. I have app instance, it has a store. I can dispatch things, for example, when I create the application, I dispatch an action to get the existing to-do. So when you load the app, you want to get the data from the server. Pretty standard. And I actually set this on a, on a window application. I don't have to always do this, but for you know, better testing, it, we can explore. Okay, so let's write some tests. And the way I would test it, right? And here's the thing. I'm not trying to sell anything. Cypress is open source. So everything I'm showing to you, you can do or you don't have to adapt it. But here's what I would do. I would install Cypress just like I would install any NPM dependence. If you're using Vue CLI version 3, it actually asks you if you want to write end-to-end -end tests using Cypress or Night. And everyone here, after tonight, should pick Cypress, right? Just the same. Okay, so it installs, uh, the process should be pretty quick. It's an Electron-based application, that means when you install an PM module, it downloads Electron binary for your operating system, Mac, Linux, or Windows, right? And the same on CI, so on CI it probably will be Linux. It's MIT license, so if you don't trust me to, to keep Cypress, 
open source and free, just go fork it, build it yourself, keep it in a locked box, right? And you know, we have a lot of docs, so you can see like introduction to Cypress right away. When you start Cypress, it will scaffold the files for you. Uh, UCLI does it for you, so you don't have to do it, but if you open it yourself for the first time, you will see that it creates Cypress JSON with all Cypress settings that you can change. It puts all your spec files, all your test files into a folder. Then you have pictures, you can load picture data, mock data, and then you can extend Cypress with your plugins and you can create additional commands and support. And let me actually start, let me show the app, right? So here's my app, I can add to-dos, I can delete to-dos, so nothing extraordinary. And here's my first test that I'm going to run. Can everyone see this in the back? I'm always afraid that the font is too small, right? So here's our very, very first test, just to make sure that we can load the app. Now, as you can see, I'm loading, I'm visiting slash, right? Because I define my base URL in Cypress JSON, so I don't have to hard code by URL. So I, I put it in a settings file. But you can see that it uses mocha syntax or just syntax uh, under the hood. So the test is called close the app. And when I'm telling it, hey, visit the base URL, get the selector, and that element should be visible. Right? So let's see how it works. And Cypress open. So I'm opening Cypress using npm script command. It shows me all my spec files and okay. So what you see here is an iframe of my website. It doesn't have to be localhost. You can load pretty much any website, your staging server, your production server, website from some other company, so you can test other people's code. So you can see the app iframe right here. What you see here on the left are all the commands in that particular test. So visit, site visit, slash, get selector, and then the assertion. I expected that element to be visible. Now check this out. So whenever I actually hover over Whenever I hover over a command, it actually highlights the element at that particular point in time. It also shows that my application, even though I didn't say this, did AJAX call to slash to do. So it actually tells you, oh, your app actually did a call to the server to fetch some, some data, right? And I didn't ask it to actually you know, intercept anything, but I know that my application, like Cypress knows that your application is doing something and it controls the network, so it actually observes all the network calls. Right now I'm not doing anything, but if I open DevTools, I have full DevTools because I'm running inside any Chrome-based browser. Like in this case it's Electron, but you can control Chrome. And because I love DevTools, if I click on, on a command, in, in DevTools right here, it will show all additional information that Cypress captured for that particular command. So I didn't ask Cypress to observe or spy on this call, but I can inspect it. So what did it return in the response? Well, there was a body, but it, it was empty. Excellent. So that's useful. So this is the simplest test. Uh, let's run a second test. So let, let's do something interesting. So we're going to visit the URL. In this case, I'm, I'm giving explicit URL. Then we're going to get a selector with a class new to do. And we got an element, right? So think of this as like jQuery style selecting of element. So you now have an element. And then you want to type learn testing, and then enter. So kind of simulating what the user would do. 
Grab an element, start typing, click enter. And then you, you want to continue. You want to type be cool. I mean, I don't have to be cool, I'm always cool. But if I wasn't, and then enter. So I'm kind of interacting with the program through the DOM. And then the, the two things that I just added should be in a to-do list. Again, I'm using jQuery style selector. And I'm saying, get all the list items, and you should have two items. Now, Cypress comes with jQuery, Chaya Search, and Synon, all the test libraries that you want, probably. Lodash, Moment, already bundled in, so you don't have to install anything, but you can. And so the assertions read like Chaya Search. OK, so when I save this, so Cypress actually watches my files, and it reruns the tests as it notices changes. So I can keep it open on one screen, keep my editor on another screen, and keep changing things, and constantly rerun things. So in this case, my first command visited localhost 3000. Oh, by the way, Cypress takes uh, snapshots of a DOM, and whenever it notices something changing, it takes a new snapshot. So whenever I hover over, over anything, it actually shows how the app looked at that particular moment. So when, when it just visited localhost 3000, it looked like this. Then it got the selector, new to do, and it highlights the element that it grabbed. And then it typed learn testing. Now in this case, I've already noticed, oh, you typed something, clicked enter, and then the dump changed. So it actually captured two snapshots before and after the command. And you know, I can see it switching. I can just pin it by clicking on the command. And now I can see what happened. Oh, before, after. OK, so my app is actually doing things correctly. If I type something and click Enter, it gets added to this list. So what is the second thing to do, right? So I can unpin this. Then it typed again. Be cool, and again it shows the two snapshots before and after, so I can see that it added the second item to the list. But my app did. I can not accept it. And then it got plus to the list list item, and it highlights again the two items that it selected right here. And it ran an assertion, and it says expected. expected to have length of 2 and it was length of 2, that's why it's green. So at this point, I'm pretty confident that at least my app can add items whenever I do something like this. Okay? By the way, so this is fully functioning app, you can interact with it yourself, you can you know, pop dev tools, look at everything. You can even you know, so do selectors, so it, it suggests like which selector to use, things like that. Excellent. So whenever I write, I'll take a break. Whenever I write longer tests, which is our advice for writing end-to-end -end tests, I don't have to limit myself to just, you know, assertions, right? Like like these little things. Do something immediately, assert something, like unit tests. Instead, we suggest that you actually write something longer, which kind of corresponds to the user story, like the whole interaction. Go to the website, log in, type this, click that, check a box, and then do a bunch of assertions to make sure that everything is correct. So it kind of matches one-to-one -to, -one to your user stories. Uh, let me show you something cool. Uh, so the bundling is included, base URL. You can have a whole bunch of API to interact with outside services, so you can reset data and so on. <coughs> but here's what, what actually sold me on Cypress. So we just ran this test, it added two items, then I added one more. So what does this mean? If I run this test, now there are more items because I did not actually clear previously saved items. And now Cypress shows an error message. Timed out retrying, too many elements found, found five and expected two. So because Cypress iframes your website and it knows everything that's going on. It can give you error messages that actually are meaningful. 
Okay? So another thing that you can do, so I was running Cypress in interactive mode, right? It had GUI, I could do things, I could see this. But on your server, you probably run something like this, where you say uh, npm run Cypress. Instead of Cypress open, you run Cypress run, which is headless mode. And so here I can say, uh, Cyp I can just run individual stack. So this is how it actually run on the server, where it opens Cypress, but you don't see anything. And I really should switch my color thing. Okay, so this is what your server would do. So run starting, it found one spec, and you know it failed. But then it says screenshots in the video. So on every platform, by default, you don't have to configure anything, Cypress will actually grab a screenshot whenever something fails. So you can just, okay. not like this. If I open the screenshot, it shows exactly how the screen looked at that particular moment when the version failed. That's nice. But also it took a video of this run. So if something fails on my CI, all I have to do usually is go to, you know, look at the video and see exactly how the screen looked at that particular moment. Which makes my life for, for debugging things much easier. And compared to test utils, I don't have any doubts that my app is working. I can see things. I don't want to say this. Okay, but but here's another thing. The, the web is not synchronous, no matter like what people tell you. Things don't work precisely as a turn of a you know, tick. In this case. Here's what happens. So I grab two elements, or whatever elements, and I think that there should be only two. So side get is a command, and this is an assertion. So what Cypress does under the code for every assertion is that it will actually rerun previous command and rerun the assertion until either the default four seconds pass or the assertion passes. Because it knows your app might actually be still processing things. There could be you know, initially five items and then all of a sudden three of them get nuked and there are really two items like you expect them to be. And you can control this delay and here's how cool this is. So instead of default four seconds, I'm gonna set a really, really long timeout. So it will rerun this get many, many times expecting to find two items and hopefully failing. So here's how it looks. And here's like where, you know, at least for me, this tool is, is closer to the nature of web application. So right now, right here, notice how this is still spinning, both the get and assertion. So right now it expected this huge like, array of nine items to have length of two, but got nine. Okay, and it just keeps rerunning and rerunning and I was like, okay, okay, I, I see. So let me just delete one item, two items. Have you noticed that these things changed? So now it expected this list of items to have length of two, but got seven because I already removed two items. It's a live application. And then I'll remove a couple more. Four, three, and notice what happens when I remove and there are really two items remaining. Boom. The assertion just passed. Because my app also actually displayed two items and my assertion was waiting for that rerunning, rerunning, retrying until it actually passed. So this retryability is built into every assertion in Cypress. You don't have to like manually do this. Which means you don't have to add you know, weights like in Selenium testing, right? Because your app will wait for right assertion and it either times out and fails or as soon as it actually passes it will continue. If everything goes well, your app is like your tests for your app are flying. 
but if there is a network hiccup and your app takes a little bit longer to like so save it and update itself, no big deal. It will still pass. Okay, so before we take a quick break, let me see for anything else. Oh, yes. If you use like VS Code or any kind of modern text editor with IntelliSense, when you hover over any command, oh, I said hover right now. Sometimes, okay. We ship TypeScript definitions with Cypress, so you don't have to configure much to get IntelliSense for everything, including assertions, right? So everything is is type accordingly. So if you're just starting, no worries, you can almost like type blindly and, and see what happens and, and where it is uh, help that pops up. Uh, so I showed typical test, failing test. Um, yes, so if you run Cypress Run, record the video. Mm. So if you run test on CI, which you should, pretty much every CI is supported straight out of a box. If you run Docker, we even build Docker images so you don't have to do anything, but most CIs work out of the box. And we have docs for N examples for everything. So here's an example of a real world test. You want to enter to do, right? So you create a little helper. Your test code should really be the same quality as your production code. No copy paste, no code duplication, keep your constants some more reuse them, right? You can bundle, because bundling is included, so you can you can make your code look good. So enter to do, enter to do, get to do items, should contain first item that entered, go to the parent element, find, destroy button, click, you can force things because it appears on hover. And then the first item should be deleted, second item should still be there, and there should be just a single item. And Here's this test running, as you can see, just, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very fast, right? If it's too fast, then I can do the command that called side pause. So it hit pause, and now it's waiting for me, and I can use those buttons on the top to kind of step through the thing. So I can actually see what's going on. And I'm not a very smart person apparently because I only discovered that command like after like a year working at Cypress myself. So, but now I'm really happy that I found it. Um, one thing that I have to say is that Cypress has a huge documentation. So everything that you see is documented with examples, guides, best practices. We spend a lot of time documenting stuff. So I talked about that. Uh, Cypress can control the network, so you have a request command, but like, it doesn't happen from a browser, that means you have no course restrictions, you can make any API call that you want, useful, if you want to like log in, change, you know, whatever. You can also spy on a network call, so for example, if, if there is a root to do, I can spy on that using an alias. And whenever I visit, I, I can wait on that call to complete. If I know that my application is making a get to do's, I can actually assert that. So, and it's pretty much the same syntax as working with dumb elements. And of course, there, is, there are things in a GUI that show it. I can stop things. So that means if I don't want to my request to actually go to the server, I can say sci root and then either give the actual data to return or provide the name of a fixture file, which is just a JSON file. And whenever this happens, that fixture file will be returned. And so my app will get fake data, even though the app actually made a, you know, a real request. So it had no idea what happened. So in this file, if I have two to do's, I can stop it, visit the app, and then there should be two items and I can actually make sure that the UI looks correct depending on, on the item that's checked or not. And finally, like, you, you can do whatever you want. So, because the app is iframed, let's say my app has like random, uses math random to generate random ideas. 
And usually random IDs are a pain to deal with when you test it, right? You know, date uh, timestamp, right? Everything that's random and not deterministic makes you writing tests so much harder. But before I actually start my test, I can go with side window command into my iframe of my application. So I get the window, and then I can use size tab window map random and just call my own fake function. So I'm literally reaching inside the application iframe and say, no, no, don't call math random, the real random, call this function instead. Okay. And Cypress comes with a Synon JS library included. So that's already like you don't have to bundle or install anything additionally. But it's a really powerful library and it can spy stop any JavaScript methods usually. It, you can control the date and time. You can control the timer so you can speed up all the animations or completely disable them. And so after you, for example, you do this, then all my test IDs will be one, two, three, four, five, and now it's so much easier to make assertions without dealing with ID being this random hash. Okay? This is very, very different from other frameworks. Here's where like WebDriver it really fails, or any other technology. They actually send a post command through a HTTP interface to the app, trying that your app, you know, does something that they expect it to be. But they have no idea what's going on. With Cypress, you just reach across the boundary and you directly replace functions, you can check variables, anything you want. Um, here's a kind of interesting test that shows this. Uh, if I go to my source pack, again, like I'm entering two items and then I'm getting the store. And the store function reaches inside the iframe into my view application and grabs the view store object. And now, let's say here, whenever I enter two items through the GUI, I can grab the store and check that I have two items. Right? Like, no problem. Anything I can do from DevTools console, I can do from my test. And it again applies the same rules, it will retry assertions, I will see everything in UI, right? The only kind of trade-off is that now I'm tying my test to particular implementation. So my rule is like, test everything for UI, then maybe add a few tests that spy and stop network calls. And those are easy, very easy to do. You open DevTools and you look, here's my UI of my application, here's what network calls I see. I'm going to test those external things. And once you are very happy with that, you're happy with features, now you start testing the internals of your application. And you start testing the view store to tighten it down. So whenever you have to refactor something, you don't accidentally break stuff that are not but, you know, obvious on the surface. Uh, so here's the test I can, uh, again, drive my application through the GUI and then grab the store and make assertions. I can do the, up, the opposite way. I can grab the store, dispatch actions, and both should actually be reflected in my GUI. Now notice that all my tests never put wait, never had to do view next tick. They all were independent of actual framework because each, each command in Cypress is this as is added to the queue, is retried automatically, doesn't care what's underneath, as long as my app can refresh the UI to reflect the data, things will actually work out. Um, if you didn't like my talk about Cypress, you can watch any other talk by a whole bunch of people who use Cypress. Um, Whereas Ekhadayo, like we knew we are a real company when we got Ekhadayo course, right? Like we made it. Uh, but the same guy who did that course used, used to work for me, right, at Cypress. So he actually did a Cypress video tutorials where he's programming <laughs> React app, but doesn't really matter. And he was programming it and writing end-to-end -end tests. So you can just watch those videos. It's pretty much, it's very, very good. Well done. It's the same content as here pretty much, but for free. And also, the ducks are there. 
and a bunch of examples. You don't have to search for that. Uh, oh, but if you do want to search, we have a search, good search as well. Um, so Bezos is absolutely free, everything that you saw. We make money not from the test runner, so we're not going to limit the test runner. It's completely fully functioning and we're going to keep it that way. We make money of big companies that, for example, want to record the test output, the screenshots, the videos of the test run, and don't want to mess with each particular CI. Because CI is not very good at showing you the test artifacts, right? Like Travis doesn't allow you to store artifacts, you have to configure S3 bucket. Right? Having a dashboard that shows everything in one place makes it so easy to actually analyze the failure compared to previously successful run. And so if you want that in private mode, you're gonna pay. If you have open source project or don't care about people watching a video of your test runs, you don't have to pay anything, right? It's free for open source projects. It's, it's free for public projects. Uh, we just finished a feature, that's paid feature, like if you run a bunch of CI machines, they can all load, balance all the tests, so all, they can all finish very quickly, and all you have to do is just add the flag parallel, and it just works. And then like, if you have free machines, everything can finish very quickly. If you have public projects, then all the tests will run on a single machine without that. So, makes sense. Uh, and <laughs> so here's the funny part. We actually officially announced that we're out of beta last week on Thursday or Friday. Today I'm here, I'm enjoying my day. Other people are trying to deal with outage. So Heroku went down completely. Everything that we're running, like as a paid feature, is down right now. I don't care because I'm here. So, uh, so one question, right? Going back to component testing, we view test utils. So again, everything in Vue test utils runs inside this artificial container with a wrapper, right? It, it, it's not the same. If you really want to test your component, like what would you need? You know, you would need a real browser and act like a real user. You want to clean up the state so each test is independent. You want to stop the server and control the network. In a sense, like what you need is the same freaking requirements as end-to-end -end tests, but you want to do it for a little component. So view test utils is trying to get from unit test to component by kind of adding artificial GS dump. Just adding more things that kind of take the unit test and try to make like scale them up. But it's very hard. It's much easier to take if you have a testing tool that's really good at like opening a page, running a code, giving you everything, and just loading into the page your component. And I like snowboarding, so like you look cool doing that. So we wrote a little util called Cypress View Unit Test. Okay? So you install it as a little adapter in addition to Cypress. And then you get this little function called mount view. So before each, instead of visiting a page with site visit, you just mount whatever view component you have. Okay? And then you write, write a test, and now your little component beha behaves like a fully functioning page. But it's not a page, it's just a component. But running inside the browser and it's a real component, you can interact just like you would interact with a page, but you see there is no, no but it's not, not a real URL, it's just a component mounted by Cypress. And uh, so I was working on this project by myself because I kind of thought it would be a cool way to do things. And this guy comes in, he likes what he sees, he's really good with you, and he adds a router example, which I couldn't do. And I'll show what he did, this is kind of cool. So we have this. So this is the uh, Cypress view unit test itself and its own tests. And here's his router spec. <coughs> so it, it kind of flies very quickly, but basically you open a page, it has some kind of toppings, and I don't know what this is. Okay, order it, yeah. So you, you come here, and you click on cheese pizza and the router walks 
and it goes to the next page. Okay, so just a view component with a router test, tested in a full browser. So Amir does that, I talk to him, and you know, we hire him. So that's another way for you to, if, if you like some product, especially in open source, backed by a company, if you contribute to the project, direct pipeline to the company. At this point, we're not hiring people because, hey, like you, well, obviously you can program, right? People come to us because they like the product, they contribute at some point, or they want to contribute, they have idea what they're doing. Of course we're going to hire them. That's how companies find the best engineers, people who kind of already participate. Okay, so in addition to Cypress View Unit Test, we wrote adapters for all these frameworks. So you can do the same thing for all of it, just mount a component and write the test. We don't think they're integration tests. We call them unit tests because really it's the smallest test for a component, right? For a function, it would be call a function and check the result. For a component, unit test would be mount the component, click on it, make sure it behaves how you expect it to be. It's just the scale, not anything different. And here's my biggest argument for why you should consider Cypress and Maybe not abandon view task utils, but see if it's appropriate for each particular situation. If you write your end-to-end -end test using this tool, everything that I've shown, except for Cypress view unit test, is completely framework agnostic. It never actually went to view library and did next kick. It only went through well-defined standard browser APIs, like DOM, like events, like local storage, network calls, like that. If you write your end-to-end -end test in framework agnostic way, then guess what? You can replace any particular element or any particular part of your app with UGX or some other framework while the test is still passing and keep the same test, right? For organizations that kind of consider the switch to view and then you come to them and like, well, once we switch, I'll write a bunch of tests, but it doesn't work. They want to write tests first so that when they refactor, especially for major refactoring, make sure they're not breaking anything because everyone's super scared. That's why we scream, right? Because when you have to test or refactor, you just scream and run away and never come back. So if you want to adapt view and you have something else, you have to start with framework agnostic end-to-end -end testing so you can convince people you're not going to break stuff. And the same with component tests, right? If it's framework agnostic, then you can replace view something else, view one with view two, react with view and, and so on. So we didn't include Cypress in view CLI. So view team came and they did by themselves, they didn't ask us anything, they didn't ask for our support or help. They just did it. Because they thought it's a cool, you know, play free way to test things. They, they love the idea and, and we have it. And then they came back well, a lot of people came back and said, well, you don't have cross-browser, it's Chrome only. Or the network staffing you have doesn't support fetch, right? It's XHR. And like, you don't do that, you don't do that. Oh, this is broken, right? We have like 800 open issues right now on, on the repo. And, and we agree. We were trying to provide the experience that's very, very different from existing tools. So we had to prioritize some features over ours. And being a small company that kind of tries to raise money and tries to sell subscriptions and support things, it was difficult. So we prioritized like, the GUI, the experience, the retryability, and now we're getting to other things, right? Like retrying your test automatically. Finally doing cross-browser the right way. We almost done Firefox with so many hacks, and then we figure out, oh, we, we're on the wrong path, we should kind of pivot a little bit at the end and support Firefox and AE 11 the same way. So we probably will do AE 11, which is no one's first choice. But we have a roadmap, and if you have an idea, go and, and ask for something else, or like suggest you know, changes or things to prioritize, we'll be very, very happy. And finally, like, I have an article on Vue.js developers, how like, I would test Hacker News as end-to-end -end thing, so you can read that. And UCLI asks you if you want to do Cypress or Nightwatch. 
usually we avoid things like saying Cypress is better than other tools. There are lots of good tools, some of them are good for your situation. So we don't actually have anything that says Cypress is better or worse than Nightwatch. Other people are going to write that outside of us. We just know because they came and asked, are we doing this correctly? Is this the Cypress way? So we have a fair comparison. So soon Cypress versus Nightwatch blog post will come to be just developers, so just stay tuned. But it's not going to be us writing it. It's going to be absolutely different users from a different continent. And, and that's it. So you can find the slides right here. And you can find our blog posts are all. And don't forget, you should always go to GitHub and star Cypress repo because we are like 10 GitHub stars away from beating Protractor and that's huge. Like now we're serious. If we are, have more GitHub stars than Protractor, then, then Google has to start to take us seriously. Right. Okay, thank you very much.